The following interview was conducted with Professor Julia C. Novak of the School of Nursing, former head of the school for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, July the 16th, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in your <coughs> early years. I was born and raised in the Peoria, Illinois area okay. and a uh, rural community in Lakin, north of Peoria, and then went to high school in LaSalle, Peru and uh, grew up in Illinois and then went to school at the University of Iowa for my first two degrees. Okay. Tell us a little bit about high school. And Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have a younger brother and two older sisters. Okay. And I was uh, in pre-nursing, sort of the nursing organization uh, while I was in high school. So I was fairly uh, directed, self-directed in terms of my goals and knowing what I wanted to do. Right. Um, were you in any student activities in, in, in high school? I was active at the junior high level actually in track and and then at the we didn't have girls sports in any uh, to any great extent at the high school level so I was in cheerleading and drill team and cavalettes <laughs> those good. sorts of things lots of activities like that mm -hmm. that sounds good mm -hmm. what made your cho choice then tell us a little bit about college and how you happened to go there and activities etc well the university the University of Iowa has a wonderful college of nursing and the largest teaching hospital in the country in terms of an academic health science center. So uh, it had just had a great re reputation in nursing and many of the students uh, from my high school had gone to Iowa so I had the opportunity to visit when I was a senior and decided that was where I would go. Right. And what uh, did you live on, on? You lived on campus and what about some activities and what was dorm life like? Or? I, I lived in a dorm and had two wonderful roommates and I'm still in close contact with one of them and uh, then I moved into a sorority house. It was a Chi Omega and active in the sorority and then I was an advisor uh, while I was in graduate school. Oh, well I was going to ask you the <laughs> next and after you finished then where, did, where went on next? I started, I, well I worked in the intensive care unit at the University of Iowa and uh, began graduate school part-time and then started to go full-time and finished my master's and my pediatric nurse practitioner program at Iowa in 76. Okay. And then what about your career path before you came to Purdue? Tell us, expand a little bit on that for us. Okay. I um, worked at the University of Iowa as the nurse practitioner for the newborn nursery in the follow-up clinic and had a wonderful position there. And my husband finished his PhD and he had an offer at San Diego State University. So we made a cross-country trek and I was seven months pregnant with my first child, so many, many changes. But we adapted quickly to San Diego and loved it very much. We stayed there for 17 years and I taught uh, at the University of California, San Diego and San Diego State and completed my doctorate at the University of San Diego. So I was involved in one way or another with all the universities there. And then I was recruited, uh, after teaching there for a period of time and practicing clinically, I was recruited to the University of Virginia, where I had an endowed professorship in primary health care nursing and uh, developed a new master's program and worked with doctoral students and was a school health coordinator for the local schools and just had a wonderful experience there. Uh, very different culture from California. And um, when my sons graduated, our sons graduated from high school, our twin sons, we were, um, my hu husband was recruited to Purdue. We had looked at going back to California, and in fact, we had pretty much made a decision to go back and, and into our former institutions. And um, sadly, my mother-in-law had had a stroke, and she was in Elkhart, Indiana. And so we needed to get to Indiana, so it was rather providential that he had an offer at Purdue. So. That brought us to Indiana, and um, and You're here still, we are. Did um, uh, did, where, tell us about the family. Did you meet your husband at, at Iowa, or yes? Okay, we met at Iowa. Actually, okay. his mother was uh, the banker in my local community, and she wanted me to meet him. And uh, I didn't expect to meet him with twenty thousand students there at the time, and and I met him the first week. So <laughs> it was sort of Isn't that interesting nice? how that works out. Yeah. Would well, you have ch and then you have children with a daughter and a son? Mm -hmm. I have three sons. Okay. I have a son who's a prosecutor in Dallas in the district attorney's office and I have twin sons. Uh, one just finished his master's here at Purdue in hospitality tourism management and he just took a job with Marriott at their sales and marketing headquarters in uh, Maryland, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And his twin brother uh, is a Maryland graduate and he is a kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs. So he's in the NFL. 
Oh, that's quite, quite, quite you know, a lot of activities yes. going on there. Yes. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, when you came to Purdue. Uh, you were the uh, d uh, director of the practical and community collaboration and chair of the family and community health nursing when you first came here. Was there an opening? Is that how your husband came? No, um, oh. my husband had been on an accreditation site visit here, and when he came back, he said, you know, if we ever go back to the Midwest, Purdue would be a great place to go. Many of his former classmates and colleagues from Iowa were by this time at Purdue. So it was very familiar to him because sure. of those relationships. So um, I had planned to just write and um, consult and maybe teach part-time because I, need, I was needed in terms of caring for my mother-in-law. Sure. So I didn't know how much time I was going to have. And Purdue recruited me and actually created a position, uh, Director of Practice and Community Collaboration, uh, to, to take a look at their two clinics and see if we might make them more cost-effective. And uh, so I started out really in that arena and starting to work with different groups and um, in the community. So up in Delphi, uh, we had a little clinic there. And um, it was, was that already in operation? It was in operation uh, as of 1995. So it was five years old, but it was struggling a bit financially. And we had a clinic in the basement of the School of Nursing that had been there since 1981. Mm -hmm. But it was really kind of an untapped resource. It was doing a nice job in some areas, but there were so many other uh, areas for exploration and expansion. So mm -hmm. I was really involved in, in working with those two clinics to get them to a financially viable state and then uh, start looking at really expansion of clinics and we now have five clinics. We'll talk a little about that in a minute, but the, uh, for the researchers there's a difference between the one in Delphi and also the one at, at the nursing school which as you said had been in existence for mm -hmm. a long time. Was that just for the university people to? It is primarily, uh, the one in the basement of yeah. Johnson Hall is primarily for faculty, staff, uh, spouses and retirees and it's really an occupational health. It's, it has evolved to become a part of the Healthy Purdue program so very strong focus on wellness and on chronic disease management. That's a different change in what it was years ago. Yes, right. yes, quite a bit of expansion. We also see some community um, clients uh, for sports physicals, Boy Scout, Girl Scout physicals, camp physicals, that kind of thing. So it's um, we're looking at expansion in that area, particularly in the area of women's health. We have many women on campus asking us for various services, sure. so we're looking at that. Right, and the one in Delphi is for the community there to just explain explain what who the users are, the service that's okay. provided. Okay, Delphi is a very rural community, mm -hmm. and uh, we see about 3,000 clients a year there uh, from Carroll and surrounding counties, and it really focuses on the working poor, um, the uninsured. Uh, we, have, we do have Medicaid and uh, some Medicare patients there as well but mostly uh, individuals who come in who just really don't have um, the resources to get to Lafayette or a larger community. Either they don't have transportation or they don't have the funds to put gas sure. in their car to get to right. uh, Lafayette. So we're very busy in that clinic and that's evolving now to a larger site. Uh, we, I was able to um, secure a $3 million grant for a building and uh, we're moving into a new building next month. So we'll go from 1,200 square feet to about 12,000 square feet. <laughs> so we're very excited about yeah. that. What sort of staffing do you have there? Uh, are you increasing, I imagine, will you increase the staff? Is there a doctor on site or? We have a collabor collaborating physician uh, as per Indiana State law. He is an Arnett physician because there is a small Arnett office in Delphi and he has been our physician since 1995. He reviews 100% of the charts and he's available 24-7 for consultation, but he doesn't see patients on site. It's totally a nurse managed, okay. nurse practitioner run clinic. So we have a staff nurse practitioner, a variety of faculty nurse practitioners, and we also have students, public health nursing students and senior nursing students and our nurse practitioner graduate students. Okay. And it's also a site for research in terms of looking at developing rural health care systems. And so we're introducing electronic health records shortly and we'll link all of our clinics together using those uh, uh, a particular vendor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're really looking forward to streamlining some of that documentation and communication continuity, promoting sure. continuity of care. Sounds good. Now let's move on. You became head of the School of Nursing and, that, uh, and then to also go into a little bit about your responsibilities and things that you've done in the school. Okay. Um, I 
was, as you said, as you asked about, director of practice for about 18 months, then that evolved to the associate head position, which was a new position. And I focused then more on the graduate program and still practice. Uh, so my focus was really to, um, the school was primarily baccalaureate only mm -hmm. uh, until we had a small consortium program, some consortium with um, Purdue Calumet and Fort Wayne. Uh, beginning in 1998, but we didn't have an independent program until 2003. So I wrote that master's um, adult nurse practitioner specialization um, proposal and took it through all of those steps. That took a little while to do, and that was approved by the Indiana Commission in 2003, and that's the year that I became head of the school and started working at the national level on the Doctor of Nursing Practice program, which is a clinical doctorate. Uh, very strong systems focus, um, trying to improve the healthcare delivery system, increase access and efficiency and effectiveness and quality safety. And so um, started working with the Regan Street Center for Healthcare Engineering to look at how we might partner to uh, emphasize. Which was the one that was on campus at that yes. time? Yes. Okay. That had started just about that time sure. as well. And I was on that launch team and um, also on the exec team for the Regan Street Center. So we really looked at how we could infuse um, the application of engineering principles to healthcare. So that has made us a very unique program in the nation. And we were the 10th DNP program in the nation to be approved and admit students in 2005. And so that was a, propose, a project proposal and project that I worked on. Uh, and it was, it's been very exciting. We've had six graduates now of that program. And we have, we went from, fifth, from five students to 50 students in fairly short period of time, and we're fairly capped now at that number. And uh, but it's very exciting. We had three defend just in the past week, oh, so very that's good. very exciting for me. What uh, prompted you to uh, you know, offer this doctorate program? Was this something? Uh, are there other schools that are doing it? I mean, certainly in nursing, when you think about that. We were the first in Indiana, and I had been the president of a couple of different national nursing organizations, so I'd had the opportunity to be at the table in Washington as, as this was being discussed, and really looking at the 100,000 Lives campaign, the, the individuals who, have, who die in hospitals from essentially medical air. And so the need for um, developing programs that were more interdisciplinary, used more of a systems approach, had more of a patient safety quality emphasis, but really um, very evidence-based. And so I thought, you know, with our resources here at Purdue and engineering, and particularly with the Regan Street Center and a variety of other um, units on campus, sure. we really were well positioned to write that proposal and our faculty unanimously approved it. And we were strategic planning all along the way um, in concert with the university's strategic plan. So uh, we were the first in Indiana. There are now, um, I think, four others either uh, on the drawing board or about to uh, begin admitting sure. students. So we've really been a leader in that area. So we're very proud of that. Um, really, our clinics and our doctoral program and our fine undergraduate program uh, are really areas that um, right. we can be happy about. What is the placement for the ones that are getting the doctor? What sort of positions do they would they be going into? Are they going into teaching or? One is a risk manager. She also has a law degree and her doctor of nursing practice. So she is a risk manager at a large uh, system in Milwaukee, Aurora Healthcare System. And the others are going into academics, but they're all very, so we can admit more students, which is also a plus because there's a, a worldwide nursing shortage. We have 1,900 openings just in the state of Indiana and about 140,000 in the U.S. So uh, having more faculty prepared at this level with a systems emphasis in their education is a huge benefit to our undergraduate students. So we've been able to grow from 430 undergrads in 2002-2003 uh, to 600 undergrads, which is pretty much the, that's really our cap at this point mm -hmm. with our current facilities and the number of clinical placement uh, clinical settings that we have in central Indiana. Right, yeah. What is the enrollment for the, has the graduate program increased then, even at the master's level? Yes, it is. Uh, we have a total of 58 students, master's and doctoral. And the master's students are encouraged to go on and finish sure. the doctorate because the master's uh, 
at, at the advanced practice um, specialization level in nursing in the U.S. by 2015 will be at the doctoral level. So it really behooves the students to keep going and to finish that doctorate. Sure. So we really encourage them encourage in that them, regard. That's right. What are some of the other changes that you made in the school? Did you, were there more faculty and recruiting faculty as well? We have okay. significantly increased diversity uh, in, we have uh, several African and African American faculty members. We also uh, have Hispanic faculty member, uh, Egyptian faculty member, and several Asian faculty members, and we are have also grown in that regard in our student population as well. So diversity has been a very strong emphasis. Um, when I became head, I asked, I created a position, the Director of Student Services and Diversity Enhancement, and, um, and hired uh, a, a woman who is uh, Nicaraguan by birth, has three Purdue degrees in Spanish languages, and so then we created a Spanish for Healthcare Professionals course for our students and other students on campus. So we've really, um, really focused very strongly sure. on diversity. Yeah. Um, the clinic expansion, I think, would be another area that we went from two clinics to two additional clinics in um, one in Monon, rural Monon. Um, that community invited us there. They did a United Way survey, and access to health care was the number one concern in White County. And we were able to get some federal money and then subsequently some state money. So all of the stars were aligned. And, and um, best of all, one of the families, local families, donated uh, the renovation of their building uh, and to welcome us into that space as a clinic. And construction management at Purdue did the renovations, and uh, that family paid for the renovations. So, the Bozick family. So that was a wonderful partnership. And that clinic, we we will probably see 2,000 patients this year in Monon. Um, due to spiraling child abuse rates in the county, we created a clinic in downtown Lafayette that is really a birth to 21 clinic, uh, primarily focused on uh, young parents. Uh, children and young parents, young families that need a lot of education and a lot of support. So we have kinder music there and reach out and read and lots of really interesting programs in addition to providing health care. Right. Um, and then so we have four really clinics. The fifth one is an academic nursing center. It isn't a traditional clinic. It's a partnership with Mental Health America and we have had support groups there for um, parents of children with special needs such as autism. We also do probably 1,200 screenings annually for depression and we're looking at how we might expand services because mental health services are, uh, there's just a great need for that mm -hmm. uh, locally and throughout the state and nationally. Right. There's also a nursing program, isn't there, at Calumet as well? Yes. Yeah, and that, that, that's a separate thing and is, is that the only other campus that has um, uh, nursing program in Fort there's Wayne, there's oh, also there's one a Fort nursing Wayne. program, and also at North Central. Okay, so but they have their the, own heads. Or when you were the head of yes. the school, you're you're not uh, was right. Was just we a, was we work there. particularly closely with North Central because they were just moving to baccalaureate, and uh, and then starting to talk about a graduate program. So we did um, more mentoring uh, with that particular program with Calumet and Fort Wayne. We had this uh, partnership for the consortium, uh, but they were based at. Fort Wayne and Calumet. Calumet was really the primary site. Uh, they had the first graduate program in the Purdue system in uh, as of 1998, I mm -hmm. believe. And they, that's been going for some time, the yes. one at Calumet, yes. right? Uh, let's t uh, one of the things that was sort of is that freshman scholars program. That, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that for the researchers. That, that's ongoing. Yes, the freshman scholars program is um, quite strong. And in fact, in the School of Nursing, the learning communities. Uh, which is slightly different. The scholars program is a bit newer, uh, but the learning communities uh, to get those nursing students together early on and pair them with faculty mentors and ha have them have that s support system uh, beyond the dormitory uh, where many of them live together uh, to really get to know the faculty on a personal level has been a, a real strength of the school as well. All right. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. And then now the other thing is that second degree accelerate uh, program, baccalaureate program. You instigated that. Yes. Um, Tell us a little bit about that particular one. That's a very exciting program. Uh, the second degree or second career option uh, is for individuals who already have a baccalaureate degree in another, in another field. And we grew from seven in our first cohort to I believe we have 17 in, in the current cohort. 
And these individuals, we have, uh, just to describe some of the students, yeah. we've had two veterinarians who finished the program, three Chinese physicians, a Marriott manager, uh, business individuals who've been in business, uh, other aspects of business. Uh, so just really interesting. Well, quite a variety of yes. backgrounds that they're coming yes. to. What are they, are they do you, how are they going to combine, say, the veterinarian? How are they going to? Actually, think? one of the veterinarians has an integrated holistic practice where she's doing both, and I haven't visited her uh, in her setting yet, but she's a local veterinarian. She also works in one of our nurse-managed clinics up in Monon. Uh, to really um, sharpen her nursing skills because she's a re relatively recent nursing right, graduate, yeah. but a very experienced vet. I think she's been in practice for 15 years. That's interesting. So she's a very interesting, yeah. interesting person. And um, they're just accepting, they have a 100% pass rate on boards. They are um, partners out in our clinical agencies. We have 130 contracts with clinical agencies throughout central Indiana. And they hit, they, I'm told they hit the ground running and they do extremely well and move quickly to leadership positions. And really the second career option is the fastest way to get a student into the workforce. So if we're looking at trying to offset the nursing shortage, uh, the expansion of that program is really, I think, for all nursing programs is a wise move and, and it is growing nationally. Sure. What's the impact of technology on the nursing? Uh, care and profession. There's a very, very strong impact. Um, we know that uh, nurses spend about 35 percent of their time documenting. So the more that we can use technology as an aid, whether it's using um, PDAs uh, to look up information or um, computers at the bedside or to practice on simulated uh, robotic uh, high fidelity simulators so that they can practice a technique and a skill over and over again so that when they go into prime time and they're caring for a real life patient, they're very well practiced and their uh, confidence level is significantly higher. So we're studying that in terms of research and uh, we now have a family of four simulators in our Center for Nursing Education. We have a, a male, a pregnant uh, woman who's delivered about 500 babies now, but she can be programmed with a computer for all different types of deliveries. So the student that didn't have that opportunity in the hospital uh, can practice uh, with a simulator. We also have a nine-year-old boy simulator and then an infant simulator. So the students have great fun practicing and it's a way for them to lower their anxiety level and to really sharpen their skills. Because when that buzzer goes off, you got to know yes. how to handle it. There's nobody else. It's panic fill sets in, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, you, um, the, the, um, that health, you've got quite a bit of support then, haven't you? Uh, I think for that one, you got that grant from the Fold Health Trust. Yes. Tell us a little about that. Uh, when I was looking at being having that opportunity to be in Washington and looking at how the other programs were developing. They were primarily focused on leadership, which all nursing programs at the doctoral level have a strong leadership component, or they were focused on advanced clinical skills at even a higher level than the nurse practitioner. Um, my thought was that really we didn't want to miss an opportunity to focus on systems. And so I went to uh, visit Fold and several other foundations in New York uh, with a group from the Regan Street Center for Healthcare Engineering. And I did my presentation of what I wanted to do and what I was thinking about for our doctoral program in terms of making it unique and having this partnership with engineering. And uh, after I did my presentation, the Fold Program Officer uh, from the Helene Fold Healthcare Trust um, said, Julie, I think that is the moon landing in healthcare. And uh, one of the engineers said, well, you know, Neil Armstrong is a pretty grad. So it was, you know, did, he didn't miss a beat. And it was... <laughs> Can't um, afford to do that. Yes, there you perfect go. segue. So they uh, awarded us a $2.5 million grant, which was the largest grant they had ever given to an individual school. And um, I'm actually going there this evening, flying there this evening to um, present to them tomorrow on the results of our second year of completion of the, of the grant. Very good. And we have two more years of funding from Fold. But funding has really been an area, when I was hired um, by President Bering and uh, Vice President Ringel, and then worked very closely shortly thereafter, within a month, uh, with President Jiski and uh, the year later, Provost Mason, uh, the charge was really to move nursing to the next level. And one of the primary areas was graduate education, and then, of course, extramural funding was the other. And so we went from around 49000 dollars in extramural funding 
to, I think we've had about eight million in extramural funding, and FOLD was a huge um, part of that. Uh, but we've had funding from the federal government, from HRSA, the Department of Health and Human Services, and also the Indiana State Department of Health. We've had many grants for the support of our clinics and also our public health um, quality improvement project, which is one of the projects of our one of our Doctor of Nursing Practice students. And so um, I've worked closely with her and another faculty member, and we've um, been able to secure a $650,000 grant. So for a doctoral student to secure a grant of that magnitude is really right. um What's the nature excellent. of the work that, uh, that she's doing that led to the grant? It started as a uh, gap analysis where uh, for avian, looking at readiness for the avian flu, potential avian flu epidemic, uh, there was grant money assigned to do this gap analysis for every county in the state of Indiana. And she was involved in that project with another faculty member and uh, some other students. And they went, they did really a SWOT analysis and knew the strengths and weaknesses of every county. And so that was such rich data, it really set the stage for other grants. And so we um, secured a grant to study 20 counties and to look at their public health, um, really their, look at how they were positioned in terms of their strengths and weaknesses and have them identify one key area that they wanted to focus on. So it might have been access to health care, it might have been might be infrastructure, might be school health, a disease entity, um, tobacco control, childhood obesity, obesity in general is a, is a real concern in many of the counties. And so really working at um, how we could work with that county to really develop programs in that area. And the CDC has been involved from the beginning, and so they have identified, based upon this grant, identified Indiana as a beta test site for developing accreditation programs for public health agencies. So the one grant led to some additional grants and ultimately led to federal funding and federal interest. And uh, so Indiana is leading the way in terms of this whole public health accreditation. But it really started here with the Purdue team and um, in really looking at public health at yeah. the county level. What's the funding, uh, funding support? Do you think it's increasing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the nursing shortage? I mean, does, how do, take a look at it since you've been involved in it for several years. It, we've, had, um, we've had some significant funding and some support. I think we're, uh, it's getting far more competitive is at NIH because it used to be that um, about 20 percent of, you know, five to ten years ago, 20 percent of the grants would be funded uh, probably at least ten years ago, probably around twenty percent. It's now down around eight percent of the grants are uh, funded uh, in terms of the application. So, uh, so that is far more competitive. So an individual that isn't well established really has to look at other grants other than an R01, mm -hmm. uh, new investigator awards and those sorts of things to try sure. to get started and try to build their program of research. Yeah. But it's, it's a challenge, uh, particularly at NIH. And then in an election year, we don't know what the future will be. Right. So, so we, um, it's very important, I always call it, uh, to develop a mosaic of support, lots of different sources of funding. And uh, that's what I've worked very hard to do and, and to uh, get as many of our faculty out to be partnered with experienced researchers so that uh, we've grown from three funded researchers to 16 funded researchers. Mm. And some of that is small intramural funding and some but is larger funded, federal yeah. funding, but it's funding. And it helps you, uh, it's really those building blocks to get to that right, larger yeah. grant. What about the clinics here? Is that, do you get state funding or federal funding for some of the, what about, is there local funding at all for some of the, say Delphi or whatever? Yes, it's oh. a, they are state funded grants from the, from the Indiana State Department of Health. Uh -huh. We also have, have had some federal grants that have clinic development as a site for the education of students as one of the objectives. Mm -hmm. So there's been some funding from the federal government as well, and we now have a federally qualified health clinic grant under review, uh, trying to get our, our clinics in Monon and Delphi designated as federally qualified health clinics. They're already designated as rural health clinics, but this would give them a, a designation that would help to make them even more sustainable in, in the long term. Okay. So we're waiting to hear about that. Uh, we have local donors, an annual fundraiser. The community is very generous with the clinics. United Way, both in um, United Way in 
uh, White County and the United Fund of Carroll County have been uh, very supportive and generous with yeah, the clinics that's, that's as well. That's very nice to know. Right. You know, these health clinics, you're really, are you planning on doing it? Or is there any plans for other others? Because I know you've been, any comment on that? You're, and that, I think the mental health one is sort of a new clinic. You addressed that before. Yes. Um, we really would like to expand services. It, it's not, it's really increased integration of mental health services into primary care. And that's okay. the emphasis at the national level because most individuals in need of psychosocial support will not have the luxury of seeing a psychiatrist. There aren't enough psychiatrists. Um, there are 13 million teens in need and 5,000 child psychiatrists. So we need to really emphasize the education of our students at the undergrad and graduate level for screening, for recognition, management, and referral and uh, around that whole area of mental health. So we'll, we'll expand within the clinics that we have. I get a call probably once a month from a rural community saying, would you please come here and develop a clinic? And there are so I many things that have to be in place to be able to do that. Sure. And we want to make sure that the ones that we have are sustained, well sustained, uh, before we do any further from expansion. Over the long haul, yeah, right, okay. Um, and you've been doing some uh, outreach engagement. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Was that Honduras or Nicaragua? We have um, international programs, a variety of international programs. Uh, one of our faculty was very involved in Honduras, actually two of them. Um, we also have faculty members involved in Nicaragua and in Ecuador. And more recently, we have a project in South Africa. We went, um, actually, uh, Prince Sedza de la Mini, who is the grandson of Nelson Mandela, came to campus and uh, he, had four, he had a long list of interests um, in wanting to work with Purdue faculty and one of them was healthcare. So I had lunch, I had the opportunity to have lunch with him and spend some time with him and he invited me to South Africa and I went with a team, uh, Marn Helgeson and Hildred Rashan uh, from the HIV AIDS research group and two uh, MPH students and we went over uh, for an exploratory trip uh, in the trip uh, was in South Africa and then some of the group went on to Swaziland and um, and we, he has since come back to campus and we've been invited to return to develop a project around HIV AIDS education uh, with a very strong focus on school health and home health and also as a part of that trip um, Crystal DeHaan who has the Crystal House Academies uh, in several uh, countries throughout the world and also has an academy in Indianapolis, invited me to go to Cape Town while I was there to visit their school, uh, their two schools, and uh, they have invited us back also to, to expand um, a school health project. And we hope to do that um, with the College of Science and take several science students along who will actually be involved in teaching projects in the classroom, and then we'll work with the school nurse and the home health nurses in the clinic at the academies, and then go out into the homes. And uh, it's very fascinating. They live in um, very, uh, very underserved communities, often child-headed households where both parents have died of AIDS. And you'll have a 14-year-old caring for four or five younger siblings. And some of those siblings are HIV positive. So these wow, uh, teens have incredible responsibility. Mm -hmm. And they're just, um, you know, really need our help. And we want to do this in a very evidence-based way and very high-quality programs that will have uh, an opportunity for really integration of discovery, learning, and engagement. Right, that sounds good. And uh, how, t tell us about the strategic plan, how you, uh, for the school, the, the one, that, the, not the current, not the new one, but yours, tell us a comment on that. Well, we've had, uh, really uh, had the faculty come together um, and have met many, many times over the past, really, eight years and have updated the strategic plan in preparation for accreditation site visit and, and because it was ready to be updated and we did that in 2005. We're just about to update it again. And uh, so it's very much focused on discovery and uh, really building that research program, uh, bringing more funding into the school, developing our researchers, hiring faculty who are more senior and come to us with uh, faculty, with uh, developed programs of research. Sure. And then in the learning area, uh, continuing to grow and develop the um, 
the graduate program in particular, the undergraduate program, probably not growth in numbers, but really uh, the second degree program, taking a look at that and seeing how we might um, increase those numbers. And then looking at how in enrollment management, how you do that as a part of the whole and a part of the big picture, because you still have to have those resources to do to maintain that high quality. The engagement piece, um, we three of us spent a week with Dr. T. Barry Brazelton at Harvard uh, learning the touch points methods, and that is a focus on nurturing young families, and it fits in perfectly with our clinics, and it's a great basis for partnership with other community agencies in terms of engagement, and some of the community partners will be going through the touch points training um, this fall. We've so far uh, educated uh, 12 of our faculty in the touch points methods, and um, we'll be expanding that to other faculty on campus and then, of course, to the community. Yeah. And we also partner through the Baby Talk program with, I believe, 17 other agencies that care for families and young children. Yeah. So, um, so we have lots of, lots of partnerships in the community. That's very, very important, too. You got a couple, I think, uh, awards. One is that uh, Women of Purdue Mortarboard Award, the second annual that you got that award. That's very nice. Thank you. And you got the Internet, Elizabeth Russell Belford International Founders Award. From Sigma Tau. Tell us a little about those awards. Well, um, I was nominated by, I think, eight of my colleagues for the Belford Award. Sigma Theta Tau is an international nursing honorary, and we have, uh, it's in, I think, 100 different countries now. Uh, so very broad global scope, and it's a wonderful organization. Ironically, it's based in Indianapolis. It was started by a group of IU faculty in the 1920s, and so it was a great honor to receive that award. And to be nominated by your peers is always a, a very That's nice very thing. That's very nice, yes. Now what are your plan now that you've stepped down as head, tell us a little bit about what your plans are going to be for I'll the be researchers. Continuing t my research in right. tobacco control and um, I'm very involved in that and have been from really the tell time. Tell us a little bit about that particular that project, maybe your research area. Well, we um, in the beginning in two thousand there was still smoking in some of the dorms and so first of all the the dorms went smoke free and we've been moving more and more toward a smoke-free campus. And I also worked with the West Lafayette community, the city council, on the smoke-free ordinance in West Lafayette and was elected to the city council in Lafayette last November. And we just passed the ordinance in Lafayette, which I'm very excited about. So as of September 1, uh, workers will be protected um, with the exception of a few uh, establishments that only um, cater to those over 21. Um, I think they're about out of the, I think, 700, oh, well over 700 businesses. There will be about 40 that are primarily um, bars that will uh, still allow smoking. Uh, but we're working on that. And um, so we've really focused on, through the TOUCH program, the Tobacco User Cessation Helpline, really uh, offered to the faculty, staff, and students the opportunity for individual counseling, phone counseling, or email support. And that has evolved in my, in my relationship with, really with the Indiana Tobacco Prevention Cessation Agency at the state um, into the quit line, the statewide quit line. And so there are, there are about 300 individuals that are enrolling each month at the state level for that quit line. So we work very closely with that group. And we became the lead agency uh, for the Tobacco-Free Partnership of Tippecanoe County. So we have several different research projects that um, are evolving. Uh, and all of that leading up to those ordinances, we did surveys of uh, a lot of the locals. Behind see, the scenes. Yeah, see what kind of acceptance was out there and uh, see what kinds of, what, what elements uh, were key for the ordinance. And so, so there, ha there has been research sort of before, during, and after sure. those projects and that will just continue to grow and we're now we now have a grant under review with the state for the implementation and transition for all of these businesses in um, Tippecanoe County and public places in general uh, not only not the county but specifically Lafayette yeah uh, so that will be another uh, interesting right. interesting project yes you mentioned I saw where you had gotten elected did you decide to uh, run how did that come about well, to. I'm on it. The tobacco was the tobacco control piece was just one part of that. It was really around the mental health needs. I'm on the Mental Health Association, Mental Health America board, and Don Roush, the police chief, is on that board. And he was telling me about how crowded the jails are, and the individuals would be 
uh, brought into the jail. They, the majority had mental health needs. Uh, they were in need of medication and they wouldn't be assessed in a timely manner because the numbers were just so um, beyond their capability. And uh, so they need a quick assessment, need to get on those meds. What was happening was they would get sicker while they were incarcerated, then be released and then commit a worse crime when they were released because they hadn't been uh, treated. Had those needs met. Uh, so that's really a focus for the future in looking at jail health care and how uh, possibly our adult nurse practitioner program can be involved in. Could be of in, assistance. Yes, All those right. assessments. Uh, in terms of what I'm doing currently and in the future, I am the, I'm continue to be the director of the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program and PI in that FOLD grant. And as we've grown from five students to 55, uh, it's very, uh, it, that keeps me very busy. And with the clinic growth from two sure. clinics to five, we're now seeing 10,000 patients a year. And, um, and so I will now have the opportunity after the first three years um, that I was here at Purdue, I was able to practice regularly in the clinics. And so I'm gonna have that opportunity to really go back to my first love, which is practice. Sure. And the clinics are a great opportunity for integrating again the research and the education and the practice. Yeah, sounds very good. Uh, how about an outstanding event in your life? Do you, can you want to share one with a researcher? Do you think of one, any outstanding event in your life? Well, boy, after you think about the birth of your children and your <laughs> that's family. Very, uh, that's that family that thing be, is very key. That would be first. Yeah. Um, but thinking uh, professionally, probably um, the awards that I've received where I've been nominated by my peers have been very meaningful. Becoming an endowed professor at the University of Virginia, um, Loretta Ford really developed the nurse practitioner movement when I received the Loretta Ford Award from the University of Colorado. That was, that was very, um, uh, it was really neat particularly to receive it from her because she's been sort of a mentor and role model uh, for me um, to receive them from the universities where you attended. And then most recently, the clinic staff um, from both the Monon and Delphi Clinics nominated me for the Indiana Rural Health Association Leadership Award for the state for 2008. And they um, got me with my, I had had, as you know, a recent injury and so I wasn't traveling, but they figured out a way to get me to this conference. Uh, it was an absolutely total surprise. and, and tell, us, very tell the research, nice. tell us a little bit about it, uh, getting that award, that's nice. Well, it's really based upon um, caring for really my entire career, vulnerable populations and really focusing on the underserved. And I'm highly committed to that. And I love working in communities where we can go in and really partner with the community. Right. I tell the students it's really like a dance and the community always leads. You can't come in thinking you are not going to solve their problems because otherwise those programs you initiate will die when you, uh, when you and your team depart. Uh, so it's really been about building those relationships um, and and really finding a place to integrate everything that you do because one as a faculty member can really be pulled in so many different directions right. and to try to find ways to integrate your interests your research interests into practice into the classroom which Lincoln really the linkages yes really benefits the students when they can see that you're involved in in those three aspects but that you found a way to do it and, and still um, you know, maintain some balance in your life. That's right, yeah. Any uh, closing comments or anything in, that you'd like to share with the researchers that you involved in your court? Well, I've had um, wonderful mentoring here from Dr. Linnell Geddes, who was, of course, ahead uh, previously, and she's been just a terrific mentor. And it's been also very interesting to work with an interdisciplinary model here. Um, it's been different for me not having an academic health science center in terms of a medical school. Everywhere I've been, I've had joint appointments in a medical school and had those physician partners. But we've been able to find them in the community and they've been great collaborators. Uh, Dr. James Bean, who is our collaborator at the Trinity Clinic, um, he's been a great mentor and friend and supporter. So I think um, really I would, you know, really reaching out and trying to get to know individuals in the community. This is a very rich community in terms of resources. Right. And uh, it's a it's very giving. Been, yes, it's been an interesting, very interesting experience and, uh, and an opportunity to really ultimately integrate health policy because I, I tell the students you can't really close the loop until you integrate that policy piece from the local level to the uh, 
state level and to the national level. And so I think that um, that's a component that we always need to think about uh, because Solving the problem for one individual is important, but if we can solve the, these issues for an entire population of individuals, then uh, we've really been able to accomplish something important. Very good. Thank you, Professor Nowak. This concludes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,